let's get started. So the way that we start these labs now is this new format, and we can do it all semester, and it's turned to probably should be a pretty good one. Because we start off going around the room saying, I am so and so, and I'd like to know X, Y, or Z about active learning or about the topic, or I have this one big point that I want to make sure that you let me say. And I'll write it down here, and then throughout the discussion, we'll go back and we'll say, hmm, let's talk about this, let's talk about that. So it gives us a roadmap. Anybody like to start? All right, Tom. <laughs> um, my name is Tom Ryan. I work in the Nelson Institute, and I just want to soak it in. Soaking it in. All right. Michelle, you basically nominated yourself. I did. I'm Michelle Harris. I teach in BioCorp, and I'm here and learn all the things. I'm Danny. I'm a graduate student in population health sciences. Um, I haven't had a chance to really teach formally in the whole class. Have All right, so so far you guys aren't getting it. All we have is <laughs> examples. We need some more specific questions. Sam. So I'm Sam. I'm a chemistry graduate student. So I'm particularly interested in how to get buy-in from students. All right, there we go. How can, in. how can students? How can I get my students to actually want to do the active learning that I'm trying to get? I'm in biomedical and um, I want to really use active teaching to help students build the skills that they're going to need to be successful at bigger tasks like what we do in our next class. So, using it as a way to put them towards skills. Scaffolding. Scaffolding. Yeah, often. Yeah. Awesome. I thought you were going to go. Um, so, there was an interesting study over the last hundred years of data where they talked about. 75% of what we grade our students on is non academic content. Only 25%, it's, it was K 12, but I, I meant, is based on the soft skills, light skills. Do they show up? Do they participate? Are they nice to each other? Um, things like that. So I thought we were going to talk about that. But yeah, well, they're in the first. Very good. Nathan. Uh, yeah, my name is Nathan Gill. I'm a postdoc in integrative biology, uh, and I've been really fortunate to receive a position as an assistant professor starting next year. So I'm excited about that. So I uh, don't have a lot of teaching experience, so I'm just here to soak it up also and learn anything I can. But yeah, I'm very interested in, um, you know, from designing the course and all that, as well as getting students involved in the project. Great. Yeah, all important. Okay. Yep. Hi, my name is Tim. I'm a doctoral student in music. I teach at the UW Community Music Program, violin guitar. And um, one thing that I want to learn is how to engage students and get them to buy it, even when they feel uh, tired or maybe emotionally drained. And I'll give an example because I was presenting in music and performance, which is called Clap for Credit. <laughs> a lot of these <laughs> and um, just last week, and as you can imagine, their their minds are somewhere else. So even if we tried to get them to buy and engage, they're just like halfway asleep. So I just would love to know your tips on that. They couldn't even clap. <laughs> they did clap. Okay, so they, that they did earn their credit for that. Day. <laughs> <laughs> so painful. <laughs> uh, Craig Cook. I'm with the libraries. Uh, part of a team that supports an active learning space, Whistle, in partnership with Sarah Mason, who will introduce her some later. Um, but I just want to get an idea of how, what people are expecting out of the space and how to better support instructors and have our students better support instructors while they're using the spaces. All right. Eric. Uh, I'm Eric Colosa. I'm a instructional designer at uh, UW Extended Campus. And uh, I'm here because I work mostly with courses that are asynchronous, so students going through a course by themselves kind of on their own. So I'm looking for ways just to kind of um, ideas for student engagement, um, help them, you know, find ways to help them, get them um, active in the course, and get them kind of continuing to move on through the course. Good. Those are good topics. Yeah. My name is Heidi, and I'm with ESL, and maybe we can 
Hi, I'm Craig Meyer. I'm an outreach specialist in the Nelson Institute. So I've uh, worked a lot with adult learners. And uh, some of the activities that we do are uh, webinars um, and also in person workshops. And I found that with our adult learners who are like 25 to 55, they're really kind of trained on the passive learning model. Um, so trying to pick up some uh, ideas that might translate to uh, webinars and also help. Great. And then, so, then both in the sort of some ideas we can but also synchronous online options. to active learning because they grew up with the well, things just to cover with it. And yeah, and they're also you know, like this time. They, right. Yeah. <laughs> it does take more time to engage. I don't have time to engage in class. Just, yeah, or yeah. prep for it. Or, so. All right. From the back, Cliff. Uh, Cliff, I work with the uh, Learn UW team. I'm just here to know what you guys need to know. All right. And yeah. Hmm. I'm in the Department of Integrative Biology. Um, I'm an advisor, so I don't do um, direct instruction, but I certainly do directly interact with students. Um, I'm curious if anybody here if ever comes from the math department. Math department? Sometimes. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'd love to see the math department here more. <laughs> They'd love to see you here, March. Lynn. Hi, I'm Lynn. I teach in the biochemistry department. Um, and I think one thing that interests me in this topic is, you know, when you're adding an active learning activity, how do you decide if it's gimmicky or if it's really high? Let's start with that. Question. That seems like a really good one. So, what is the difference? Anyone want to throw out a idea? Well, I have learned the hard way. <laughs> How it feels to you like you're playing an activity for a kid's birthday party to keep them busy. It's the wrong thing to do <laughs> because they smell okay. that on you. <laughs> and so, and yeah. if you're going to do that, there better be cake. <laughs> you better, yes, and treat that. Yeah, they don't want busy work. They, they resent that and they feel like they're just taking up an hour of their time. So, know. is it connected directly to either? Will this be on the exam? Or does, is this relevant to my career? That's where I learned to hook it, but I, I never. And can I see that direct connection? Yeah. So some good active learning activities have that element made into it of, OK, as we do this, think about where you're headed, what you're planning on doing, your life experiences, bring those into it and incorporate it. And if you give them a simulation or scenario that they're like, this will never happen to me, this is a waste of my time, then they won't just do that. Or, or if it's something, if everybody around you is doing the same activity, I actually got a from 153 Ooh. students one time when I said, we're going to do concept math. They apparently did that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and they knew me well enough that they could do hmm. me, but they were funny kids. So explain this for a second, the remedial teaching. Oh, um, I teach in the school of nursing. Were you the first big active learning classroom back No, no, we were not. But 17 people, they used to, they used to see nine students. It took them a whole lot of time to get them three to nine students to teach to that capacity. Um, and then it's completely wired. There are some drawbacks to it in that you can't move the furniture around because they're wired. So there are times where I would like to do like fish bowl activities and I can't. Um, or or have students get up and move. It's a little more difficult, but um, so every table has this. Um, this oh. yeah. And I I came to teaching really late, um, so I had to learn this on top of how to be a teacher all at once. 
sounds like it's not just determining what techniques are gimmicks but finding the right way to sell it I, I don't want to at the risk of sounding like a car salesman it's like yeah you're trying to convince them because <laughs> because I can hear students hear this hear you say I want to do this thing they're convinced it's not worth anything so that you're saying no 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 <laughs> let me show you why and when did teaching become marketing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> <you> <laughs> Before that? Yeah. Yeah. 
you've gotten a lot of feedback from students so they, um, where uh, they, they recognize when it's a gift mm -hmm. or when it's an add-on or when it's something that an instructor is trying to do to mix up the you know the activity or to get them to buy in what they value is when they see purpose for the activity and that it's integrated into the that they can tell that it's going to help them in their learning whether it's you know daily or over the semester and they also have given us feedback that you know throwing in a lot of different strategies just to mix it up all the time is super confusing and not helpful and so my recommendation out of that to our instructors is to select your gimmicks with purpose yes. and align them with your learning objectives, but then also be very selective about which ones really enhance what it is you're trying to do and how you want students to interact and how you want students to do that active learning. And then you can't, then you don't have to do the marketing. It's part of your curriculum. And you know, students will learn as they as you know it comes up time and time again where it's you know important for them to, to buy into it. You don't have to pitch it and say, really, this is my world for me, blah, blah, blah. You know, you just so yeah. So, and that's I think that's a really important thing. If you do too many different things. Every new thing you do has a learning curve, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there's chaos and confusion as we're trying to figure out well, what does she want, what does it really want mm -hmm. from us? Well, is this useful? They have to go through all of that and figure it out. And that's a lot of extra stuff that takes up valuable cognitive time and energy in your class. But to the other extent, if you do it all the time, it's like, all right, we know how to do this, and we no longer see value in it. It may have been useful the first five times, but now it's like I'm so over that. Baking it into the routine is a really important strategy. So if you can have like three different things, five different things that you do multiple times, that's good. I think your point about fit is critical. I, because I actually did write the shift. I should have told the end of the story. So they've gotten this assignment of concept maps over and over in every classroom, but it hasn't been a good fit. I've never used it before, but I was teaching case management, and so there it makes perfect sense, right? Draw this thing, figure out where the priorities are, figure out the low hanging fruit. If there was one thing about a person with complex problems that would make the others go away, circle that. So then when they can see like why, why we're doing this, the concept map, because that's the way case managers actually think. And chart, then they then they got into it having yeah, purpose. But until they could yeah. see that, you know, this is the way you need to learn to shape your thinking to be an effective case manager. They, so Sophia, yeah, have you like made your learning objective transparent? Students can build a model to learn to this person. And then you just then just look at it at the beginning of class. And then don't call it concept now. So you just use whiteboards. And maybe they'll come up with something that really yeah. 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 I agree with what Michelle is saying that if you focus on this is the purpose for the learning, like we want you to learn this, not we're doing this activity, mm -hmm. right. we're doing this, we're doing this so you learn this. And then I also think that having the um, the closure to the activity is highly important because as your experience shows, they don't realize it until they're in the thick of it, maybe what their needs are going to be. So having just a quick reflection at the end, mm -hmm. like show the learning. Right. And what did you, you know, what, and, and, I, and sometimes I even ask the question, why do you think we had you do this in mm -hmm. this way? And then have them make that reflection, that connection. Oh, that's a great trick. Yeah, yeah. that's a great trick. No, mine was simply, I said, everybody throw a whiteboard and I guess I did. Like they knew it was coming. <laughs> um, but I think it was, it, it would have helped had they known. And that reflection period, again, is one of those elements of good learning that is so important and so often we miss it, right? Because we just finish the activity and then bing, the bell rings and everybody leaves and we're like, think about that for next time. <laughs> and they never do, right? Because they're on to the next class. So we have to build that in, again, build it into the 
to the activity, stop. When you're done, before you leave, give me a short paragraph on why this was important, or what you gained on this, or what you could have gained on this, or how it could have been done better, or something like that. Yeah. Good. At the top of our, um, at the middle of the front page, we've got levels of active learning. Um, when the active learning boat arrived on campus here, they said, we need to do more active learning. And I was like, all right, let's talk about this. What is this active learning? And there's a framework about active learning. And um, Nikki Chin is a seminal researcher in the learning sciences. And she talks about these three different levels of active learning. There's active learning, which actually isn't all that good. It's note-taking, it's highlighting. It's your eyes moving back and forth as you watch the instructor go across the room. That's and actually good. And that's, that is actually important, right? It's an important part of the Sagats. It's, it activates part of your brain. There are studies that show that any sort of movement associated with taking things in actually helps you learn. So good, better than just putting the speaker in your pillow. <laughs> Constructive learning is where you have an individual to create something. Constructionism or constructivism, you may have heard your students get some concept and then they figure out what does this actually mean for themselves instead of just hearing what it means. But right? they construct the meaning themselves. Constructive learning is where they create something based on what they learned. The highest is interactive learning, where you have multiple students, or they call it a student, a learner, and an intelligent agent. So it could actually be an AI someday. Um, go back and forth and work on solving the problems themselves or, or building something, building some new knowledge based on multiple perspectives. In many ways, what we're doing here this morning is we're having many people work on this question of what is active learning, giving examples. We're doing good interactive learning. Are you the intelligent agent? I am not the intelligent agent. <laughs> I am just a program. <laughs> you guys are the intelligent agents. <laughs> Um, I just meant like alpha version of AI. Not even alpha. <laughs> like, this is, there's so many bugs. <laughs> mm, it's a problem. <laughs> um, but so that might be a useful framework for you to think about. What are the things that you're doing? And is it interactive learning? Is it constructive learning? And you can, I've got this table here that you can like map out what are some different examples that you're doing. Not everything has to be interactive learning. Like, give them a break sometime to not have to deal with other people because it's early in the morning, they haven't had their coffee yet, or it's just after lunch and they just <coughs> have the energy to digest. So, you bring it up. I'm worried a little bit about introverts, and I should look that up. But and universal design for learning is how we have multiple means to let them express their mastery. And making introverts or people who just need a little bit more time to think about stuff, making them sit in a group and have an argument, that is not necessarily an effective way of doing that. Give them some ways to do that in an online forum or they can do it asynchronously, right? This is where the online asynchronous format is fantastic because people can have these conversations at their leisure they can look at what they've written, they can proofread it, they can send it to a friend to double check it, and then they can hit send. So they know that they, they feel comfortable and confident doing that at their own pace instead of being put on the spot. Craig, what do you have to say about that? Or, look, you know, I'm thinking sometimes we do rubrics, I'm guilty of this too, of having it, you know, active participation that time to think. To and give them models. Give them models both of the, you know, fourth grader Johnny in the classroom saying, ooh, 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 ooh. All right, that's good. Problem. Um, but, you know, again, if overused, it's not so good. Give them examples of people online doing that. Say, look, I've built in multiple ways for you to participate, and you will get credit for participating in any of those ways. If there's another way that you want to participate, let me know about it and I'll build that in as well. 
So that gives them the agency. I would add to that that within a, a face to face class, you can move back and forth between this constructive level and this interactive mm -hmm. level, yeah. where you do have time for individual work and reflection, and you have you know the interact interactive, and you can even do some like little mini lectures or like demonstrations or like if you're doing a case study you set it up or you uh, see that people are struggling with a common thing and so you say I'm going to do a little tutorial over here anybody who wants to join me you know can come over here and do this so you can do the um, you know bring in those people who aren't part of you know it doesn't have to be full active learning you know the whole uh, session of your teaching and I like your online option as well. I mean, you can really think beyond the classroom as well as physically. And the think pair share is another great example of moving across all levels. Yeah. You start off with, all right, here's the concept. We give it to you. Why, question for you now, prompt. Why does da 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 da, -da happen? Think about it for the next two minutes. Write down your answer on a post note or sheet of paper. You wait two minutes and do that. Now turn to your partner. And tell them what you wrote and decide between the two of you what is the right answer and then share it out with the class. You can do that in lots of different ways. And that spreads the gamut and gives them a little bit of what do I need to do here? What, are, what is she asking me to do? What are the things that are part of this? And then think about it. Then probably share it in a safe space so I don't have to share it with everybody right away. But I'm pairing up with somebody next to me. I'm probably sitting next to you because they're not too scary. So ease us into that interaction. Good. The multiple means of expression, I think, is another one that we want to talk about. Um, and in some ways, we're starting to talk, I'm sorry, multiple means of engagement. We just talked about it. So multiple means of engagement. This is, this is a big one, right? We've all come to our positions in life with our own set of experiences. And along the way, we've said, this is so inspiring because of, of this. And what we forget is, this is so inspiring to me because of this. We forget that to me part. So if you look around the classroom, you will see a lot of not me's in the classroom. But we tend to say, I know that this is effective because it was effective with me. So we'll do this fantastic presentation of great exercises, fun activities that are really engaging to us, but not necessarily to the people in the classroom. If we can give them ways to and actually make it part of your job to why how can this be important to you? What is the book? They can't think of it right away, but some of them will be able to think of something. And if that gets shared out, that triggers other people's idea, uh, ideas and thoughts. It's like, oh yeah, mine's kind of like that too. That's what it helps. It's like group things, it's like brainstorming, the crowdsourcing of ideas, it leads to better ideas. So anything where you can have the students share with each other, even in an, an online synchronous or asynchronous way. So, and even synchronous in class online, where they don't have to raise their hand and do something, but if you can include things like the Google Slides Q and A, gives them a chance to ask questions. I'm sure that is um, or ways for them to get their ideas in the back channel on screen for other people to read. That helps people start saying, oh yeah, building off of so and so's knowledge. I'm interested in this question. We saw that this morning as well. We said, oh, you know, based on what so and so said, I don't think I'm actually interested in this as well. Other ideas? Oh, the other thing about that? By having the students come up with the examples or engagement things, they're doing the work. So it's hard for us to do this, right? We can come up with two or three things, but we only have a certain amount of time. If we take five minutes and say, all right, everybody take a piece of this, we can get a lot more. And 
it's a lot more relevant to the classroom than it might be to you, you know, as you learned this stuff 30 years ago before. You know, kids these days have different priorities than you do. Castle topping. Does everybody know what castle topping is? Nope. All right. Castle topping, if you think of the old castles with the archers, they had the little things. Crenella Crenellations. What are they? Crenellations. Okay, they had those. They had them. I know. I know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Crossword, crossword puzzle. Like just last week, crossword puzzle. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and the idea for teaching is to turn yourself into a force of no, it is to have this preparation time before class, and then the class time, and then after class, we have a reflection time. Okay? So, the students should know this, that you are asking them to prepare for class, and we always say, next week, do the blah, blah, blah reading, right? And then they come to class, and what happens? Nobody's done it. And was ready for class. Nobody's yeah. done it. But if you get into this and you say, we will do stuff in class that requires that you have done the preparation, including maybe an assessment, then they will do the preparation. They need that, yeah, part here. They need that opportunity to, to gain um, credit for that. It will also help them have a more interactive because you're ready for that. I took that discussion project last spring and we were like students while we were while we were learning how to make discussion, but she she one day said, Everybody just take two minutes to read the article. She knew it was and I did find that that was really at least I could get it, but I had it after that for students, even without a oh, discussion project. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna misrepresent it. It was through the so help me. It was through the Department of Education. Oh, okay, the discussion project. I mean, it was called a discussion project, yeah. but it's like a six week course where it's faculty who's learning to do discussions. This is like I thought it was pretty good. I think some of the editors, but I actually learned at the time. Um, so at, at the Haitian Academy in Winter Retreat two years ago, we had um, Diane Hesse and Paula McAvoy lead a, a project um, where they talked about how to lead a class discussion. And their focus was mostly on in-class face-to-face discussions, but the basics are set your students up, give them time where they can prepare for it in class, and then put them in the discussion. I think there are roles, you have to represent roles. She had, by then she really expanded, so there were, yes, that was one of them where there were roles, but every week. Okay, and I don't know all of the methods, but one way to do this is to say, I don't care what your position is on this topic, read this controversial article, and you're going to take position A, you're going to take position B, you're going to take position C. Um, the way that I did it was author advocate, devil's advocate, mediator, and troll. <laughs> <laughs> author advocate is whatever you agree of, agree or disagree about the article, you have to support it and bring in two other pieces of evidence from outside in the world to support that, the points in the article. Devil's advocate, same thing, but against it. The mediator is, is there a third way? Show me two ways that we can make it work. Or, you know, it's here, I thought it was an act actually work. Wouldn't that be great if there was always a third way that works? And then the troll is, welcome to the age of the internet. You have people yelling at you, getting in the way, and as academics, we need to be able to have that skill set to deal with them in a civil, professional way. So how do we get those skills if we don't have that practice? And then the next week, the author advocate becomes the devil's advocate, the devil's advocate becomes the mediator, the mediator becomes the troll, and the troll becomes the author advocate. And you do that four times, not too many throughout the semester, four times. It gives everybody a chance to play all in the different roles. She did not teach you that. Well, that's great. Do be careful about the trolls. Set some <laughs> rules. <laughs> Say, even though you're a troll in this class, don't be a troll. You look stupid. But the fun thing is, for the troll, it's, it's kind of a day off, a week off. 
It's not really because they still have to show that they've read the article. Um, but they get a chance to sort of be a jerk. And sometimes you know like that. And yet we're not really jerks because it's just the role that I was assigned to play. So you know the job's not really a jerk. I'm joking. In this instance, I'm, I'm just play. really good at this role. <laughs> I'm really good at it. So that again gives the students a way to do this in a way that they can recognize holes and like, oh, I can act with this. Hi, you asked about module zero and this, um, and the general courses. We do have a module zero, and we have a graphic that shows pre class, old class, discussion, lab, kind of how it all maps out. It's not perfect, and sometimes the students don't really get it at the start, but at least they have that to, to look at. But we do, um, to John's point, um, Whenever we do have a pre-class activity, there is always some accountability piece to it. It's either a quick Canvas quiz or it's um, something in the simulation that we have that has questions embedded in it. That and it does start class at a higher level because you know that they've at least absorbed some of that material. So one of the other things that you guys do for buy-in that I think is really good that addresses the buy-in question is you started videotaping students from previous semesters. Yeah, so um, one thing we did is we got um, students from previous semesters that had shown growth in a certain way or were particularly successful in a certain aspect of the course. And um, we had them, um, we asked them questions like, you know, what, what advice would you give to students coming into Gen Bell? And um, so we compiled them, and we have, I think, seven total, like one to two minute videos that are about succeeding in labs, succeeding in discussion. Um, how to get help, all these different things, and it's peers talking to, you know, through a video to their to their peers. So we have that in module zero. One thing I think we do need to do is come back to that after the first after each exam, but particularly after the first exam, we do reflection about what they could do differently. Great. And I think we need to point them back to those videos because they're absorbing so much. The first module zero, it kind of flies over, but after that first exam and that first grade, when they're really thinking about changing. Things, I think that would be a good time to look up those videos kind of pop up in your head. I would love some AI that would say, you answered this in your reflection, you might consider watching this video again. I don't know how to make that happen. But. Another way to use those that um, we have some videos of students uh, reflecting on their experiences in the active learning classes, and we show them to the uh, new instructors. Yeah. And actually, also repeat them in our orientation for people who can teach me over on time. It's a good reminder to you know to really hear from students what works and what doesn't. Or you can send them an objective to the actual teaching lab and hear from other instructors. Yeah. Danny. Yeah, I'm going to ask this, but what is module zero? Okay, so I would say the best way to describe it is that we, blend, you know what we mean by blended course or blended option? So blended is putting some of the learning into an online space and right. some of it into face to face. So um, by having them do a pre class in the online space before they can do a face to face, that's what the castle talk is kind of about. So okay. we've taken the syllabus and we've broken it into a module that the students interact with before the first day of class. Also, just like a one time thing in the very first. Right. So, so their very first pre class of content, they can't unlock that until they've done the module zero and no. answer the associated questions. So, instead of having a whole class period devoted to a syllabus and making sure they understand, we've moved that to the online space. And then the nice thing about that is it's always there. They can go back and look at it. Um, if they have questions, um, they can absorb it at their own pace. And if you know a student is feeling overwhelmed on the first day of class, sometimes all that syllabus information is a lot. So they can reopen the class a week ahead of time, and they get a chance to kind of move through that. And you can quiz them on it. And if they don't do a certain level of performance on understanding the syllabus, understanding the learning outcomes, understanding why you're in this class, understanding what the class will cover, understanding the rhythm of the class that they will get used to, they can they 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 can start the class actually in right. some ways. So yes, yeah, so we moved our lab safety quizzes into that space. We've moved um, questions about the, the core structure itself. So they have they have unlimited attempts, but they have to get 100 percent for the 
Yeah. My question is just, is there a Canvas template that we're there is a Canvas template. That. We had a thing on Canvas templates two, three weeks ago, um, and we shared them. And we're going to have more um, in the first weeks of teaching effectively in Canvas. And Cliff also has ways to share. Um, well, just if uh, if you do decide to talk about it, you want to explore the the um, templates. Just understand any of this stuff, you can pick and choose when you, I mean, if you've got a course that's already being developed, you can pick and choose some of this content to bring in. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to like throw everything away, bring in a whole new template and then kind of repopulate it or anything. So. Fresh on the class right now, but I'll be teaching in the spring. So it's a that's, time, uh, so that's a, is there a template that I really that I should be there, there, There's a template that has some pre-built content and whether or not it meets, then you just need to go and investigate. So it has a thing to share. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The castle top model and uh, the idea of being thoughtful about you know, not just the, what happens when, but also how to take advantage of what works well online, uh, what works really well in class, so how to how to juggle those. We have a course, a uh, short course called Blend at UW. A lot of people here have taken it, uh, where you do learn a course design process for making a blended course and the deadline for applying Today. the winter winter session. We'll have two winter sessions in January. Uh, the deadline is today. But we have other other ones scheduled later in the semester. So grab one of these if you haven't already. One's on spring break week. Right? Yes, there and is one talk spring about break designing a course and completing templates. The idea of the week zero is also how do I how can I be successful in the course? Give your students tell them how to be successful in the course. Give them, you know, at least one pathway to be successful. Okay. Thank you. Is there a problem with asking students to do things before the semester starts? Like, technically, yeah, like the, the semester starts and it's the first day of class. You're, you're asking them to do stuff before, which I technically have a problem with, right. but there might be people who are traveling, who literally show up the first day. Has that been a problem, or do you have a way to, like, we do so we that's a good question we um we make the the first pre-class that's due for class on content does have that deadline of class start time if a student for extenuating circumstances can't do all those things we typically work with them to open it up and, and give them a few more days but we um it hasn't been that much of a problem most students are pretty eager to Kind of get started, and, and you know they're they're especially with chemistry, they're they're nervous about it, and so I think you know having it open, having the ability for them to look around actually helps more than it uh, distracts. But um, yeah, that's a good question, and we always have a few um, people who just for one reason or another couldn't get everything done in time, and we just handle those on a case by case basis. But it's you know, it's not it's not terrible. Yeah. Uh, for our course, um, I, I push out a couple of courses, blueprints for courses, so, so things don't get, get the same thing and all the students get the same thing. Um, and for those courses, the first day is usually a writing sample. So welcome to class, write an essay for 50 minutes. You know, that's, that's what they get. So really the instructor's job is to say, hey, look at Canvas, there are some tasks to do, and, and that gets them ready. It also gets them into the course. You know, so often, at least for my day, the first day of class, I come, I listen to somebody talk about the syllabus, I hear about the textbooks, I think about how long do I have to buy the textbooks because I'm out of money right now, and how long can I put it off. But this way, with the learning management system, in many ways, the LMS has changed a lot for that. Because you can get students engaged right away. They don't have to worry about using the syllabus paper in the bottom of the backpack, things like that. So starting even earlier, think about it. They're registered for the semester before. They can already, you know, today, the first week of finals, first day of finals, right? As soon as their finals are over, they could start thinking about next semester's class. <laughs> I'm theoretically here. I'm not even going to be I'm speaking of next semester. We do have some sessions before this event, before class start. Um, and these are our teaching effectively in Canvas sessions, but this year we're running them as active teaching labs. So if you follow each 
this discussion useful and have a few laughs on these types of topics. Brian Barney and the topics that we were supposed to do for us. So that is a thing to think about as well. Um, so what haven't we talked about here that we should talk about before people go? How to make it better. So I've done something. It was successful. Ish, successful ish. How do I do it better? Yeah. Sample. Okay. So it's on uh, underneath the activity sheet, the very bottom. Um, there's the two going. Oh, refresh maybe. Recall. Okay, yeah, the sample. So this was an this was an activity for discussion class, and um, we. Uh, the idea was that we wanted them to see patterns in titration curves. So what you see here are the notes for TAs about how to facilitate this. So um, if you'll scroll down a little bit, those words, that's all right. So, okay, so um, there were 22 or 24 graphs, and each student was given a graph, and then the TAs were told how the students talk to each other, find the similar ones, and get them, you know, if they are acid being titrated by a base, they go to one side of the room, if they're base being titrated by an acid, they go to another, and then they have these questions and they eventually separate themselves out into categories and they start to see these broader patterns. The TA... So it's find your buddy. It is, right. And um, so those numbers in the upper right-hand corner, I can't remember which digit, but one of those digits is the magic number that tells the TAs exactly which curve it is. Like the fours, I think, are strong. The, the middle, the second four, I think, is a strong base by uh, being titrated by a strong acid, and then the ones that have a three are maybe a weak base with a strong acid. I can't remember exactly, but there's there's there is method to the secret code. Yeah, there is method to the madness. But um, so they were, you know, the students would get up, they walk around, and we got mixed reviews. Some of the TAs loved it, so their students did great. This might be part of the buy-in and the selling of the activity, and you know all that body language that comes in. Um, some of the TAs were like, mm, I don't know, it just it didn't quite work. So what we did the next time is we thought of a different option. So I'm going to go back to the next option. We had a challenge. And so what this is, is, um, so go to the next page. That's the bonus period. So now we have them in groups. And we want them to, with their group, classify these different titration curves based on those questions. And then when the group feels like they're ready, it's kind of like the Price is Right game where they go through and you say, out of those nine questions, you got six right. But the T doesn't tell them which ones are wrong and which ones are right. And then they go and they kind of reconvene and they think about it. So again, it was, um, this one succeeded. The, the TA said the students loved it because they liked the challenge. They liked the mystique of not knowing exactly which one was right, which one they missed, and they um, were working together. So. It could have been on the verge of being gimmicky because it was that, you know, tell me what your answers are, that kind of thing. But um, it's late enough in the semester they've been doing a lot of worksheets, a lot of group work, a lot of take care share. So it was kind of the right timing for this. Um, and it didn't it didn't seem to we had more buy-in from the instructors and the students for this version. We offer up both versions sometimes if a team really likes the other one. Um, but that's an example of something that worked ish. And then we modified it to make it still, we still wanted the pattern recognition, we still wanted the collaboration and talking with each other. And then the bonus part is if a group finished early, if they got on the second try, they got them all right, they can move on to the bonus questions. So if you have different um, levels of completion around the room, they've got some. This is great. This reminds me of, um, has anyone used the scratch off sheets where there's right answer and you, you take I know this. Yeah. And you, you, Scrape of it just like lava, right? I have, they're cheap and it's like $15 for a point. Um, somebody in that teaching that in the past was talking about how the system puts students into groups, gives them the questions, and they have to decide the answer. And once they decide on the answer together, they scratch it off, right? And it's the big moment of the reveal. Gimmicky? Oh, I can't. Super gimmicky. Do they love it? 
Yeah, they love it because it's a physical thing. You get to scratch it off. You get the stuff in your fingernails or whatever. Um, and then it's like, oh, we did it! Yay! We got that one right. But if we didn't get it right, now the next one is like, all right, we could have gotten all four points. Now we can only get three points. Which one do we have to do now? Is it A, B, or D? We scratch it off. So it becomes this like there's this tension involved in it, and it's a group consensus building for every end of time. And they do it as a group, and then once they get them all right, they turn them in. They say, which group did the pass? And it becomes this group level of possible competition. Gimmicky, but apparently effective. Do it every day? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's that was our situation too. Like we, you know, the, the timing of it. And you can do this two or three times a semester. Absolutely. Yeah. That mm -hmm. is, the TAs were asking for more of that. And we one time we did a group quiz um, instead of the usual individual quiz because of the timing based on the exam. And the students loved that too. And it required collaboration. We had a set of rules that kind of built, you know, like the TAs could not help them find the right answer. And whatever the group agreed with, they could turn in that quiz. And that's what was graded. We just talked to each other. And, um, <coughs> You need that balance between doing that every so often and the individual quiz so they don't get the losses. And again, it's an interactive learning. Um, there's, a, there's a social reassurance, right, in interactive learning mm -hmm. where it's like, I am getting it. If you do all individual stuff, the way that I went through school, like the only way that I knew if I was getting it right was if I got the test results, you know, back. Sometimes they were the dot. And the dot ones, so I didn't even know which ones I got wrong. I mean, we just knew that I got an 80% on this test and the questions I got wrong. Not great feedback. Getting that feedback, either from the instructors or from the peers, is, is a great way to have it. I was just curious when you're doing teamwork. Do you yeah. do a lot of teamwork in the classroom? We do. Um, in a discussion class, it is very group work centric. We just don't have a lot of stakes tied to the group work right now. So like this thing, this was just an activity. We, you know, getting it on the first try, the second try, just a matter of you know. Yeah, we're not going to learn to not get the group of two high stakes, or if that comes. Right. right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not fun for them then, and they, they get too uptight. But right. I thought I was curious if you. I learned, but maybe it's your thing. Um, you know, I learned that I needed to leave. I needed to assign the groups, not let them choose their own, because they get really clicky. Yeah. Um, and then I needed to keep the group the same over time for them to get a working relationship. But I wonder yeah. if that's yeah. true for everybody or just what. And we, we, we do address that in our, um, with our PAs and how they choose to do that. So we offer up some options of, you know, if you need to mix things up, you can say, um, I like playing cards, you know, pass out. Right. You know, so if you, if you are twos, you all get together, that kind of thing. Or you know, <laughs> we talk about ways to mix things up. If need be, um, but we also talk about, especially for the introverts, they like knowing that they're those groups. So it is, it is a skill, and it's something that you know we talk about. And, yeah. In the discussion project, they talked about setting up the groups very thoughtfully, so that you have different representatives and different perspectives. So there is some learning. So it's not yeah. just a bunch of friends having a conversation, but there's there's some thought yeah. behind it. There are many. Having the groups, actually, that should be something that we should have a whole session on how to pick groups. Capney is a tool, and it's capney.com, I think it's C A P M E, and I think it has a free version of it, yeah. but there's also a paid version of it. And with that, you can have students um, set them up according to, like, is it called gender balance? I want all kinds of questions that you can ask for them, and it will automatically create groups randomly. With these factors factored in. Um, Morton Grimfather says that she assigns groups the first time, and then throughout the semester, after the second time, she lets them pick their own. If she finds that the people who hate group work, if you group all of them together, they're much happier. The people who love group work, if you group them together, they're happy being put together. So it's matching again um, in a different way. So there are so many different strategies and ideas on that. Any last thing before we are sending off? Oh my gosh, yes. Thank you. So, yeah, I think it might be interesting to talk about online. I am glad about it before we talk about that. This is um, a product of one of our. 
former TAs. She's one of the teachers in post doctoral in the spring. But she took a semester long lab course and compared what was the practice and what was what this is trying to convey is um, how our students in lab work in groups to carry out their own authentic research projects with questions that they're choosing. And so this, for instance, represents our first semester of lab, our second semester of lab, and this is our third semester of lab. So in the first semester, there are three different projects that the students do in groups, but for each project, they go through um, an iterative authentic experience in terms of making initial observations, developing their own hypotheses. Um, here's where they're writing, they're speaking, giving feedback, coming back, doing the experiment, gathering data, interpreting it, and then giving feedback. Um, also the papers and kind of instructors, and then using that to write a final paper. So I think thinking about online, it, what it does is um, helps us to anchor the research task. So we say today, this week, what, are, where, what step of the process of science cycle are we at while we're working our experimental design? And while we're thinking about data and how systematically we find data. And so what it does is it cements, not cements, but it solidifies their understanding that science is not the scientific method that goes from very separate process and um, it just becomes part of the thing you have an assessment yet but we suspect it just becomes part of the understanding of the work that you're assigned. I think it might be interesting to think about this for online courses. So at the beginning of each module the students may be asked to identify at what point you know in this journey toward achieving learning outcomes what part of that and it's a roadmap for folks, right? It's, yeah. And part of why am I doing this is I don't see where we're going. So why am I doing this? Oh, because this is we're here and we're doing this process. So it not only reifies that there's a cyclical process to it and we're engaging in that in the class in real time, but why am, I doing this today? why am I doing this today? Why am I doing this one assignment, which is part of this thing? It, it all gets in and out. All right, and there's more about that. You can read through the primer and such on the link here. Thank you for coming. Please take a second and check some boxes and write a topic idea if you like. And we are done with the semester. We have over 2,400 participants since we started. Um, next semester, we're going to have 30 some more labs. So, two a week, starting two weeks before the semester begins. Um, if you have any ideas or want to participate in them as a contributor, uh, let us know. Thank you.